Welcome to Have You Heard, where we talk about issues at the intersection of agriculture and engineering. Let's get started. Here are your hosts, Morgan Hayes and Josh Jackson. Welcome. This is the Have You Heard podcast. Uh, this is episode number 19. We're going to talk today a little bit about how we move cattle on our farms. We're going to start today with a little bit about what's been happening on the farm, and then we'll cover a little bit more about moving cattle and, and our approaches and how they work. Um, <clears throat> I'm Morgan Hayes. I'm an assistant extension professor at the University of Kentucky in the Biosystems and Ag Engineering Department, uh, and I work on livestock facilities. My personal life, my husband and I farm around 500 acres in Boyle County with a commercial cattle and hay operation. And I'm Josh Jackson, Assistant Professor in Biosystem and Agriculture Engineering, as well focusing on precision livestock farming. And I farm in Mercer County with about um, 60 mamas, mama Angus cows, and focusing on hay production as well. Okay, Josh, let's go ahead and get started today with what's been happening on the farms this week. So, uh, you know, not too much happened this weekend because both you and I had the equipment uh, field day, the equine equipment field day uh, down towards Oldham County. So we were down there for part of the weekend uh, just showing, you know, small farms, what's, what, they, what they can do as far as uh, sizing their tractor and sizing their equipment and what equipment they might need. So that was part of the, my weekend. And then uh, the rest of it, uh, my other brothers decided to drop every tree possible they could on a fence line. And, you know, the ones that came down naturally as well. So I spent a good portion of the weekend as one person. I had two saws and just went chainsaw as much as I could, knocking as much out as I could. Sounds like a fun plan. It, certainly once they start hitting the tr the fence line, you have to get them out. So there's yep. certainly a lot of work to do to get that done. Yeah, we've had, and there was actually some weather, some wind that also took some stuff down. So a little bit probably unintentional uh by saw but also probably also some limbs and stuff down just just some was random and then the others was just uh it was they thought the tree was going one way then part of the tree went 90 degrees and hit the fence so yeah, yeah it is one of the challenges it is one of the dangers in in cutting down trees is actually anticipating where it's going to go usually if you've got one <clears> good <throat> straight tree it's pretty easy to know where it's going to go but unfortunately most of the trees that come down naturally and by and by design, by farmers are not trees that have one good straight limb on them. Yeah, this one had two or three Ys in it, so it made it complex to predict, you know, where it's going to go. And mm -hmm. so they, what they thought they, was, they knew was going to happen didn't end up the case at all. <laughs> <laughs> <Did not. laughs> yeah, so. we had a pretty low-key weekend as well. We had, uh, similar, we had the, I had the machinery um field day uh and then uh it was also my birthday and my mother-in-law's birthday so we were able to to celebrate those and have dinner actually had steaks from one of the animals off of the farm which was kind of nice nice uh, and my mother was in for that which was wonderful and then the other thing we did was uh just did some planning work and prep work for some other projects that we have ongoing so sunday even though it was a beautiful day we and we did spend quite a bit of outside just you know getting things ready for the week uh, we also spent some time just doing some planning work on paper, which is not very exciting, but probably a good part of our process just to make sure things end up where they need to be. Uh, we did confirm that we found someone to build. We have a fence line I, I mentioned last time that we're getting ready to put in with a neighbor. We did communicate with the fencer, and he is going to do a couple things that we asked for specifically that might not be part of his normal uh, fence building procedure, but things that we wanted done, uh, and he's going to get them done. So we won't have to get that fence done in the next month. Uh, that takes some pressure off on the fencing front. We have other fencing we have to do this year, but nothing is due now at the beginning of May. Uh, one of the things we are getting ready is trying to anticipate where we can move cattle to utilize grass that's up against that fence line with the neighbor early enough or late enough. So having a strategy for rotation so that we can get them off of that ground near the neighbor before May 1, but also make sure that we aren't overusing such grass that we are going to run out of grass because we can't go back there until that fence is done. And hopefully that'll, that will be early May, as they said, but it could take, you know, weeks. We, we understand how fence builders work and it is dependent upon weather as to when they can come out and how cleared neighbor can get it so there's a lot of you know variables but not bad 
Yeah, because we're getting kind of dry there. You know, we're getting kind of dry. Yep. At least in our area. I don't know about you guys. So We were also getting a little bit dry. I mean, nothing that was uh, desperate, nothing I would have described as drought-like, at least not yet. Um, but just the rain sense. the last couple of days has been helpful in the sense yep. that we will it will refill soil moisture levels, uh, allow grass to grow. Plus, we've gotten out of the 20s, uh, and that's also helpful to grass growing. A couple nights in the 40s and 50s, uh, hopefully more in the 50s, and days in the 60s and 70s will really encourage some fescue growth. Yep, yep. Hopefully get a good growth and get a good grazing stand for this uh, this May. Yeah, we have a lot of people that have already put animals out on pasture. We haven't actually put very many animals out on pasture yet. Uh, we're trying to anticipate how soon we can do it. We're hoping for April 15th at some places, but we recognize that we still might have another week or week and a half of grazing if we put them out on April 15th, or of hay feeding once they go out um if we do that at the 15th we may hold some of them back another week past that just to protect stands okay what about you uh you know we're we're holding them back right now just because we're we have the hay resources and so we're just trying to utilize what we had it's not you know most of it's in barns some of it isn't so trying to use what we have that's outside and mm -hmm. then uh, whatever hay we do have go ahead and you use that so that uh, you get empty barn as much as possible. That's a pretty good plan. So yeah, I think I think overall I'm I'm pretty positive about uh, the hay season coming up and the grass season. But certainly we don't want to be aggressive and overutilize it early and and end up in a tougher spot later in the summer because we did something wrong early in the year. So just sort of planning all of that out. But what we're really going to talk about today is moving cattle because as we start getting animals out onto pasture again and start doing rotation and having to call them back in to work them all these things uh you know there's a lot involved in that uh so what are you thinking <laughs> are your primary approaches for moving cattle so our primary approaches you know we have different groups we have our cow group our fall cow group some heifer groups we try to give a little extra feed too um, but we typically utilize, if they're the cow group, they're easy to move because they kind of know the general layout of the farms, even though we move them between farms, they know that when we're there, open electric fence gates, they go right on through. Our heifers can be a different story. <laughs> you can open the gate and then they'll, they'll see it. They knew it was that, you know, it, you know, they try to bust through it, but that, you know, it, it's always sometimes a challenge for the heifers because they're just not used to things take place so sometimes if we have another cow out there with them it actually is easier because the cows know the layout and they're able to help them move a little easier yeah so i mean one of the things we do use to move if we have to move animals between different locations on the farm and there's not good access points we actually use border collies we use border collies blue healers so a different couple different dogs okay. so we have about three different dogs that we'll use depending on the situation okay. so we have an older border collie who knows what to do trained himself and so we have some general commands for him like come by go clockwise and away um, so general commands but we, we have not read the book on how to properly train a dog and so we're relying primarily on their instinct to some degree we have a general command set where they have to easy 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 just means they should lie down or slow down what they're doing and then go get them means push them hard yeah and um we, we kind of just whatever they're doing we try to make the voice command match with how they're doing. So we can hopefully get them trained and they, they've learned over the years how to work with us. Yeah. And so we, we still need to read and read up on how better to train a dog, but for the most part, we're just relying on their instinct. That is, I think that's a little bit of a challenge in the sense that I think some dogs are better suited for that and other dogs struggle with that. 100%. I've had... You know, one really, or two or three really good dogs, and I've had two we've kind of relegated to. They're never going to work cows. <laughs> <laughs> they're never going to, you know, the one that is scared, and he'll just, he'll just, he doesn't even go near the cows. The one looks enough like a border collie where I can move the heifers with this, this one just because it's still, it has the appearance of a border collie, and they know enough to be afraid. And so it kind of works. It kind of <laughs> works. <for you. laughs> That's funny. So... You know, the other one, but we do have one that is, he knows what to do. We've, he's worked with us. And so if we're moving out there with the cattle, we typically are behind them pushing. If we're yeah. trying to move them, we're behind them pushing. And so he'll be back there with us and he'll go, 
catch the, the edges, catch the edges and the flanks. And then he's also one of the most important things is away. You know, he knows if we say away, he gets in front of whichever one we're kind of pointing towards and gets in front of him and turns them okay. and brings it back. Yeah. So away is a huge. Usually that's away, just like we just say away and then point at the, whichever cow and he'll just go and turn them the opposite direction. Okay. That's really nice. I wish I had a dog that did that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we we typically use people to push cattle. Um, so we use myself, my husband, family members, um, and then a four-wheeler, obviously. Uh, usually whoever runs sort of flank, whoever's pushing up on the side will run the four-wheeler. Whoever's pushing from behind can walk on foot. Um, we do have multiple four wheelers. I don't actually like to push hard enough to have someone at the back actually on a four wheeler because that tends to put a little more speed than I want in the group. Uh, and that's how you get them to go through a fence instead of through an opening. Yep. Um, but the person who pushes the side almost has to have extra speed. Uh, and none of us are young enough or in shape <laughs> enough to do that uh, without some sort of motorization to, <laughs> to get us there over and over again. I will also say that our cattle move pretty well. Um, they like rotating. They're used to rotating. We don't tend to have huge problems with that. Even our heifer groups are pretty easy to train. We usually start them, um, in an area with smaller lots. So they rotate more often. So we tend to develop heifers on one of our operations where all of the lots are four acres. Okay. So they move almost weekly during the summer. And that means that they get very used to it very quickly. Uh, okay. And they like grass. Uh, so they are willing to go for grass, um, which is nice. And then we also find out which animals on that farm are not going to respect an electric fence and we can sell them early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because it is all electrified internal fence. It's five wire, uh, but there are some creeks and gullies and things where they can push underneath that bottom wire. They probably get zapped a little bit, but some of them are willing to risk it. And that means that's an animal we probably don't, don't need, need to keep to on our farms because we have a lot of electric fencing that we use for rotation. So um, we kind of keep an eye on the cows, that the heifers that don't respect the fence at that point and, and make our decisions. The other thing I think that's been really important is we've done almost all of our internal fences on three farms in the last five years. Okay. So we have different rotational systems with different sized pastures, but all of them, we have created lanes and ways to push. So we have put our gates in the right spots yep. and corners where they can get pushed. And we've put our, uh, like getting to our working facilities, we've created pathways to get them there that are contained that one or two people can push rather than having to set up gates or create some way, or we're just pushing them into large open areas where they can turn and every which way they want. None of that is particularly productive. It's very frustrating. It means you're frustrated by the time you even get them caught, let alone working <laughs> an animal. Um, so all of that has been really good. All of that has made the whole process easier. Plus we've put Almost all of our water tanks now have a contained area at them where we can capture an animal if we need to. So if we have an animal with a limp or pink eye and we don't want to get up a whole group, almost all of our water tanks, we can capture an animal, load it onto a trailer, and take it to a working facility. Okay. Uh, and all of that, I think, in combination makes pushing animals easier because we're not now trying to push one animal up by themselves for pink eye through four fields by itself. Like that... That makes it harder to move animals because the more that they get stressed moving, the less likely they're going to move well the next time. So now the setups are set, set up. That's a little bit ironic that I use both that in the same time. I don't know. Sentences <laughs> are not going well today for me, but yeah, I managed was... to teach class this morning, if you guys can believe it. Um, the setups, though, really do help keep down stress for us and for the cattle. And then when they have to move, it's a lot easier because we haven't worked them up the last time we tried to move them. I mean, that does, you know, that layout is especially important. I mean, yeah. the layout is, is key. And I think we have two farms where we've redone the layout. And there's a, in both cases, there's a pond in the center. So we're able to put almost a, a high traffic area beneath the pond with the waterer. And it's right. able to rotate between yep. four different fields just from that uh, kind of nexus point. And that's the thing. If you know that that water tank is where they move through and they know that they go through it to get to fresh grass every time, it's not hard to call them into the water tank. Yeah. Um, and we sort of use our water tanks in the same way. They're almost always between 
pastures and we can call into a water tank and either capture there if we need to or just straight through for the animals and they're very comfortable the water tank is a a good spot for them they like water so that's generally not a spot that they're afraid to go uh, if we need to do some feeding we can also feed because we have a heavy traffic pad around it uh, and it's large enough that we can drive equipment through there so it's a pretty large area in all of our water tanks which does help feed okay. helps uh yeah. Encouragement helps. Anything that we can do so we don't have to push as hard and we can call is is the goal. And your your cows call pretty good. I mean, ours do fairly well. They're all roly poly, and they got that way for a reason. <laughs> they all roll. Ours actually do call well. Uh, they're not roly poly, uh, and maybe they're a little more hungry, and that's why they call well. Uh, but they do. They call well. They absolutely know my husband's call. They tolerate my call. Typically, one of the things we do is. I said that we bring all of our animals into a barn when we mean them. Every time we drop feed, we call. So every day they get fed twice a day. So every animal between, you know, six months of age and eight or nine months is getting fed, right? Right. By us with a call before the food drops. Uh, and that's intentional because otherwise they don't know our calls. Uh, other people can come on the farm and make really strange sounds and nothing happens, right? They right. they have to recognize the sounds. And it's not that they're not trying to make the same sound that we make, but it's a different voice. It's um, for anyone who hasn't ever tried to call cattle. Um, it's It's not like it's a specific word that people use. I mean, some people have a very specific word they use, but it's more of a sound, almost a guttural sound that... Yeah that cows want to hear, uh, that they like, that they would also make kind of a lowing kind of sound. But um, <clears throat> it just happens to be that that's how we get ours trained to hear our voice and come. Okay. The only time I have problems is when it's really windy and they are <laughs> upwind of me. I can't get my voice to <laughs> carry that far. My husband can get it to carry further than me, but I struggle to get my voice to carry over a, over a ridge top when the wind's really blowing. So I have to, I actually have to get out into the field to call him. He can almost always call him from the gate. Okay. Huh. Yeah, and they, but they do follow fairly well though. It's... Yeah, uh, cows are fine. Heifers are actually pretty good too. The one group that does not follow fine is calves. Oh yeah, calves, it's cat, yeah. And for you with a mainly fall calving group, that's probably not <laughs> as challenging. For our spring calving herd, this is a huge challenge. Uh, we um, really struggle to get spring calves <laughs> trained to rotate. The one good thing is spring calves will also figure out how to get under an electrified fence to find their mothers if they don't follow the, the gate is yeah. open. We'll do everything in our power to push the cows through and then also the calves, but sometimes they get they get run down with, the, not literally run down with the four-wheeler, but but pushed with the four-wheeler more aggressively because otherwise they go They go crazy. every which way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're not as easy to push, uh, and they don't incentivize to food or fresh grass. Yep. And ours, uh, you know, the, I mentioned the dogs, so that's one of the challenges with the dogs is the cows with calves. Yep. And so the cows with calves, you know, then they'll start chasing the dog. As the dog is close to the calf, cow chases the dog, and so then it becomes a real big challenge. So you almost have to, in those situations, sometimes we'll bring two or three dogs out so they can't. The cow can't try to just chase that dog. She's got to worry about the other dogs and then keep, they keep pushing, excuse me, keep pushing the cow. Right. The, the combination of dogs is able to push a little bit easier. The group up. Or if they, if sometimes it's just cow calves. We'll actually just work them strictly on foot. Yeah, I, I would say that generally what we do is we call the cows and if we can get them all through, we essentially close the gate and we might leave one person at the gate to open it as we push up the calves. That, But I'd say generally after... When we've been in rotation and we're getting into July, so they've been in rotation for a few weeks at that point, 70, 80% of the cows will always go through with the cows. It is always two or three really irritating ones, and yep. it's usually the same ones that refuse to go through the gate with the group for the whole <laughs> summer. Yeah. And those are not the those are not the heifers that I like to keep. They have already made their uh, made their bed. <laughs> yeah, they made they made an enemy of management, so... <laughs> That's about how I would describe it as well, an enemy of management. So, But we all know who they are. So if, if you are farming as well and you have the same experience, let us know. Because I know exactly which calves I'm not keeping, usually very early in the season. So if they, yeah, if they don't listen, not listen at that age, they're probably not going to listen. As they go. 
Well, they're also flightier animals. This is a pretty good indication that they're going to be flighty as adults, um, and there's no reason to keep them um, both as steers where we're finishing animals. I don't want flighty animals. I don't want the energy that they're eating to go back out for them to run around crazy. Uh, and for heifers, I certainly don't want that. I don't want anything that's going to be that excitable. So uh, I want things that respect electric fence, and I want things that will come to call. And if they don't do those two things, they're not really particularly helpful in our group. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of in the same boat. I don't want any animals that make my life harder. Exactly. Actively, actively make my life harder. It's, they have enough challenges as it is. I don't need them actively. <laughs> <laughs> actively working against you, yeah. So... And we're the same way because if we're happy, we have bulls, we have heifers, we don't want to keep animals that are just going to be a challenge. Exactly. So that's sort of, that's another indication. It's actually probably an earlier indication than anything we've talked about so far. But generally animals that I continuously can't get to go through a gate with the rest of the group are animals that I think probably are not keepers. Um, occasionally there's one that will just get like, a, be asleep on a hill and get lost and you'll have to push it down and it'll be a little bit worked up. But if it goes through every time last, it's always one of the last two or three in that group that refuses to go. I get it's I get to know who you are very quickly. It definitely becomes on the radar. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of our approach to working cattle. So similar to you, I use incentives. I use calls. Um, uh, new grass is always a good incentive. It's not hard to convince an animal to move if you have a good rotational system, which is nice. Yep. It, it definitely does help if they see that grass on the other side of the fence. Sometimes they self-rotate, you know. <laughs> so. sometimes, yeah, sometimes they beat you to the gate and open it themselves. That's <laughs> always positive. Not really, but sometimes it happens. Sometimes it happens. Like, well, I guess well, that's taken care of now. Fix the fence and life goes on. Absolutely. So let's, um, let's just take a minute and talk about what's happening on the farms in the next week, what our goals are before we show back up here and do another podcast next week. Uh, so ideally, you know, our manure spreader is still getting fixed. Um, so we'll probably try to get that back, spread some manure. Um, uh, can't do that. Still got to repair the baler. I still need to take off our tractor to get, uh, some brakes worked on. So still working on repairs, probably similar to you trying to get some manure spread. Um, and then we've done a lot of the maintenance on our hay equipment. So the cutting equipment, the rake has been done. We just got to finish up the baler. Okay. Yeah, you're doing pretty good. So we uh, got our trailer back together, which is positive. Okay. Uh, we got the manure spreader tire off. It hasn't been taken up yet. We're waiting till it's not pouring rain like it is today uh, to take it up there. But this week, that that tire will also get replaced. Uh, and then we also have manure spreading on our long-term agenda. Uh, in the short term, we are absolutely going to bleed all of our fall cows this weekend. That is our goal. Yep. We are going to, uh, and when I say bleed them, I mean we're going to pregnancy check them. So we're going to get about two milliliters, three milliliters of blood. Not huge amounts of blood, but we're going to pull a little bit of blood from each animal to see if they're pregnant or not. Um, that will be hopefully a good decision maker in deciding if we have some animals we need to cull. We actually have enough bread that we're we're looking to call out of this group somewhere between somewhere between five and ten, probably hopefully on the five or six side, but if they're not if they're not bred, it'll be more than that for sure. So Okay. Yeah, I I'd actually forgotten about that. So that's something I gotta make sure we got enough blood to. Similarly, you guys probably just getting the supply, getting the blood tubes, getting the syringes and everything else just lined up and yep. ready to go. So. Yeah, it's just a little bit of extra work, but um, I know that having a vet out is actually technically considered a slightly more accurate way of getting a measurement because the blood can come back positive even if they've had an early abortion. Um, so um, a lot of people prefer to have the vet out to do it, but because we have them in multiple spots, it's it's more difficult to have a vet come out and actually preg check all of those animals. A little bit more costly, but that's the main reason is just for convenience. It's a pain for a vet to come out and have to move. Yeah, shoot and and the vet to two different locations to check animals, uh, and this way we can kind of control the speed at which this gets done. We kind of do a little a little differently. We'll we'll test everybody with blood, and then all the ones who came up open, double check them. Yes, we will do that as well. Uh, the, that that's when we do get a vet out. Say, all right, we're getting they got the crosshairs on them. Check and see if they're bred or not. Yeah, we will we will do the same thing. Anything that tests open, we will also um recheck we've had we've had um blood tests come back 
inaccurate before. Not very often. One year we actually took the samples on a Friday and our vet diagnostic lab here in Kentucky will run pregnancy analysis, but they run it on Wednesday, I believe. I believe, yeah. Wednesday morning. So it just so happened that the blood was pulled on Friday. And even though it was refrigerated, it it was a little bit older. We typically try and pull Sunday for that Wednesday run so we can drop those samples off on, on Monday. But in this case, we ran a little early. And, and we actually had a number of animals that were either a not bred or a questionable. And all the questionable ones were bred. It was just that the sample had sat and it was a little bit inaccurate. Degraded a little bit. Yep. So sort of interesting, but that's on the weekend agenda. Hopefully the weather cooperates. Saturday is not looking good. Sunday is looking possible. So we're going to give it a, give it a go, give it a go on Saturday or on Sunday and hope that we can get everything done. At least get our large group done. We may have to do that smaller group early next week in the evenings, but we'll make it work. All right. Sounds like a good plan. Okay. So we'll be back next week with another podcast. Um, and we hope to see you guys then. Thanks. See ya. Have You Heard is a production of the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food and Environment, along with the Department of Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering. Discover what's wildly possible at ca.uky.edu. Edu.